Good morning, Alice. Wake up! Oh, good morning, Jack. Please give me a cup of coffee. Bring me back to life. I'm still asleep. Here you are. Mm. So, what are you doing today? Well, first I'm taking mm. a shower. And after that, I have my daily appointment with Ask the Stars. Ask what? Don't you know it? Sorry, no. It's the horoscope I listen to every morning on the radio. It's fantastic. I can't start my day without it. <laughs> How can I go out in the morning without the advice of Ask the Stars? Please, Jack. This is not a joke. Our entire life is driven by planets. By the way, what are you doing today? Well, I'm going to work, just like every day. And today is Tuesday, isn't it? Mm. I have to go to the karate gym. Wow. Are you doing anything this evening? No, I don't have anything planned. Well, Sharon, Anne and I are going to the cinema. Maybe Peter is coming too. Would you like to come? That sounds great. Which film? We're seeing Interview with a Vampire. Not that film, guys. I hate horror films. Why don't we go to see the latest Julia Roberts film? Mm. Oh, please. Damn. We don't need more romance. We already have our love story in the apartment next to us. With Peter and Sharon, I mean. <laughs> OK, you are right. Let's go to see Interview with the Vampire, then. Well, I think I prefer to stay at home. Now I've got to go to work. Uh, see you later. Is everything OK, Jack? Yes. Why? It's late, that's all. Bye. 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 And welcome back to English Today, your live TV program where you can learn the English language. And in this lesson, we're going to look at the verb have. Now, the verb have, you think, well, that's easy. It's not true. It's actually quite complicated because there are two ways of using the verb have in English. I can say, I have a scooter or I've got a scooter. Well, in this lesson, we'll look at the first way, I have a scooter. Now, in that, our last episode, do you remember that Alice said, I have my daily appointment with Ask the Stars. You know, she believes in the stars. I have my daily appointment. Just simply the verb have. Now, I want to give you a little test before we move on. If I say, I have a scooter, how would you ask me the question about that? Mm, the scooter? How would you do it? Have you a scooter? No, no, that's not possible. Something missing, like an auxiliary. That's it. Do you have a scooter? Now, this is a typical mistake. People often think that have you a scooter is a question. But the verb have needs an auxiliary. Do you have a scooter? OK? Listen to this. He has a scooter. He has, Mr. Snake, a scooter. What's the question? Careful. What's the question? Has he, no, 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 Does he have a scooter? Yes, that's it. So you need the auxiliary. Does he have a scooter? Fantastic. Let's look at the screen and check on that. So the verb have. I have blue eyes. You have a new car. She has, third person, Psst. Mr. Snake, S. Look at the spelling, H-A-S. She has a cat. He has a dog. It has four doors. We have a garden. 
You have a course, an English course. They have three children. Now the negative. I don't have blue eyes. You don't have a new car. She doesn't, look at the pronunciation. She doesn't have a cat. He doesn't have a dog. It doesn't have four doors. We don't have a garden. You don't have a course. They don't have three children. Okay, the question, do I have blue eyes? Do you have a new car? Does she have a cat? Does he have a dog? Does it have four doors? Do we have a garden? Do you have a course? And do they have three children? Okay, so that's the verb have. Don't forget the auxiliaries do and does. Now, another interesting thing about the verb have is that often we use it in special expressions, which make up verbs with particular meanings. And in other languages, here in these situations, you hear make. Let me show you. We say to have breakfast, breakfast in the morning, to have lunch, one o'clock, and to have supper. So to have breakfast, to have lunch, to have dinner. Now dinner is what time? Dinner and supper, what's the difference? Dinner at eight o'clock in the evening. Supper is something we have at about 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, all right? So we use the verb have for these. We don't say to have a breakfast, but to have breakfast, have lunch, have dinner, have supper. Other things, we say to have a cigarette. We say to have a cup of coffee, to have a drink of any sort. We also say to have a shower in the morning, you know, psst, to have a shower. In other languages, they use make a shower or make a bath, for example. But in English, we say to have a shower, to have a bath in the bathroom. We also say to have a rest. We say to have a party. Did you have a good party? We say to have fun, which means to have a good time, okay? So these are very common expressions which we always use with the verb have. Have breakfast, have lunch, have dinner. Okay, now when we go back and listen to our friends, they will introduce the other form, have got, and then afterwards I'll tell you all about it. All right, so see you then. Bye. Fly me to the moon. Let me Have you got a moment, Peter? I've got a problem with my computer. Uh, I don't know very much about computers. And I'm going out. They're waiting for me at the theater. <laughs> Always busy, huh? Okay, okay, Sharon, take it easy. Shall we have a look? Thanks, Peter. You've got a big heart. Let's see if I can help you before you thank me. All right. I can't use this program. I use it every day, and today it is an opening. Hmm. Why don't you turn the computer off and then turn it on again? OK, Peter, that's really a great idea. You're a genius. How can I do without you? I know, my dear. What are you working on? I'm writing my curriculum because I would like to find a new job. Listen, Peter, I don't know how to write it. Can you help me, please? I'm sorry, Sharon. I'm in a hurry. I have no time. I'm late. They're waiting for me. Very kind. As usual. Listen, Peter. Anne, Alice, and I are going to the cinema this evening. Would you like to come? I'd like to, but I can't. I have to... Go to the theater. Yes, I know. 
You always have something else to do. No, oh, come on, Sharon. What's the problem? Maybe you're jealous of my career. Oh, Peter. I'm just tired of always coming second. Hello, and welcome back. How are you all? Did you notice that Sharon is tired of coming second? Well, I understand her. If you live with a musician, you need to be very patient. Now, Sharon said in that last episode, she said, have you got a moment? Then she said, I've got a problem with my new laptop. Have got, and this is what I want to study with you now. The second use of have, have got. Now, in order for you to understand it better, let's do something in a typical ton context where we would use have got. Let me tell you about my present situation. I'm in a flat, but I have to leave the flat and find another one. And I saw an advertisement in the newspaper for a flat which looks quite interesting. So I want to call the owner of the flat and ask him some questions, all right? So listen to what I say, all right? Now, his name is Mr. James. Four, six, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, seven, eight. I hope he's in. Let's see. Mr. James. Hello, Mr. James. Yes, hello, my name is Louise Evans and I saw your advertisement in the newspaper for a flat and I wondered if I could ask you some questions. Great, okay. Um, um, how many rooms has it got? Yes, okay, so two bedrooms, good. A living room, a kitchen, bathroom and toilet. Very good, fine. Um, has it got a garage? No, okay, so I have to park my car in the street. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. And a garden, does it have a garden? No, ah, uh, okay, a small balcony on the second floor. Good, fine. And has it got central heating? Central heat, yeah. And kitchen, kitchen electricity, oh, well, we're okay. getting an electric kitchen is fine, why not? Um, another thing is air conditioning, it gets very hot in England in the summer now. No, all right. Um, does it have easy access to public transport? Oh good, so there's a tube nearby. Fantastic, good. Um, another thing is, um, um, has it got big windows? Because I love a lot of light. Small windows, uh, right? Has it got any views? The road and the neighbor's garden. Okay, and, and one more important thing. Um, how much does it cost a month? £1,250. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, I'll think about that and I'll call you back. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. £1,250? Oh my God. That's a lot of money for a flat. I can't afford that. It's impossible. Now, did you notice that I used has it got a lot as a construction? Has got, have got. That's what I want to talk about. Now, this construction have got was introduced into the English language to describe possession, in fact. But now we use it in different situations, not only possession. So the Americans, in fact, use the verb have more than have got. In British English, we use have got a lot. All right, now let's have a look at the construction. So in the positive form, I have got gets contracted to I've got. I've got some money. You have got becomes 
you've got, you've got a scooter. She's got, she has, she's. Looks like the verb to be, but it is in fact has. She's got long hair. He's got a shop. It's got a balcony. We've got a house. You've got some CDs and they've got some plants, all right? So that's the positive. Now, the negative. In the negative, the auxiliary have turns into a negative auxiliary. So, I haven't got any money. You haven't got a scooter. He hasn't got long hair. She hasn't got a shop. It hasn't got a balcony. We haven't got a house. You haven't got any CDs and they haven't got any plants. So hasn't and haven't. And then in the questions, the questions are easy. We use have or has. So have I got any money? Have you got a scooter? Has she got long hair? Has he got a shop? Has it got a balcony? Have we got a house? Have you got some CDs? And have they got some plants? So it's not really difficult grammatically. You have to remember the auxiliary have and has, and then remember to put got. All right? Now, you'll come across this a lot, especially in subtitles in films. So watch out for it, and we'll keep practicing it. Great. So that's the end of this lesson, and I'll see you again live very soon. Bye. Hey, Anne. Houseworker. Yeah, at last. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Ooh, how are you and Peter? We're fine, thanks. Listen, I want to go to that bookshop. Do you remember? Oh, yes. The one with lots of photography books. Yeah. And thriller books. Yeah. And with the red coffee tables and flowers on the windows. Yeah. And where you can sit down and drink a delicious hot chocolate. Yes, Anne. That's the one. The London Reader. It's a great place. Yes. How do I get there? Um, is it far? You can walk from here. It's about ten minutes away. Great. Oh, OK. <laughs> Let's see. Go out the front door and turn left. Easy enough. Go straight ahead, past the traffic lights. Right. Straight ahead, past the traffic lights. Turn right into June Lane. June Lane. Then follow June Lane to the end of the street and turn right into May Avenue. Just a moment. Turn left on May Avenue. No, no, no. Turn right into May Avenue, and the bookshop is... Hi, the... Sharon. What are you girls talking about? I'm giving Sharon directions for the London Reader. So, uh, turn right into May Avenue, and the bookshop is the second shop on the left, next to the butchers. <laughs> no, Anne. Sharon, the bookshop is on the right, past the museum and between a chemist and a bank. No, <laughs> no, Jack. You are wrong. Yeah. The bookshop is... Okay, the... okay, guys, be quiet. Don't worry. I've got my map. Uh, Sharon, I can come with you, if you don't mind. Great. That's very kind of you, Jack. <coughs> Jack? Housework? Do you remember? Hello and welcome back again. Now, Anne's a bit jealous, isn't she? I mean, how can she attract Jack 
if she asks him to do the house cleaning. I mean, she's more like a mother than a lover, isn't she? Well, anyway. Now, she gave some directions to Sharon because Sharon wants to go to the bookshop. And actually, Mr. Monkey wants to go to the same bookshop. So I want to test those directions to see if they work. Let's imagine this is the bookshop, okay? Mr. Monkey wants to go there. So let's see her directions. So go out of the front door and turn left. Okay, Mr. Monkey, turn left. Great. Then go straight ahead. Go straight ahead. Until the traffic lights. You know traffic lights? Traffic lights are red, amber, green. Okay, traffic lights. And at the traffic lights, turn right, like that, into June Street. Okay, follow to the end of the street. Then turn right again. Okay, and go down May Avenue. This must be May Avenue. And the bookshop is the second on the left. One, two. Here's the bookshop. They work. Now, I was using the language of directions. So I want to go to the screen now and show you that language, the language we use for giving directions to people. All right? Now, we usually use the imperative form. What is the imperative? The imperative is just the infinitive form of the verb. So you can say, take the first left or the first right. Take, okay, that is just an infinitive. Take the first right or the first left. You could say, take a bus to take a train to, take the subway. Now, in America, they say subway, and in Britain, we say tube. Take the tube to, okay? Another example, turn left, turn right. So turn is the verb, turn left, turn right, okay? Another possibility is go straight on, straight on, which is an expression we use in Britain, or go straight ahead, which is an expression that they use in America. But we use both, straight on, straight ahead, all right? Then we can say go past the shop or go along the street, a road or an avenue. Again, we use go, it's the infinitive and it's the imperative form, all right? Another example, at the end, we can say the position. It's next to, it's near to, it's opposite, it's between, it's on the left, it's on the right. You remember the prepositions that we did at the beginning? Well, that's to indicate the actual spot. Great, so that's giving directions using the imperative form. Now, uh, let's go back to our friends in That's Life and listen to Jack, who is giving Alice instructions about using the internet. And listen to the imperatives that he uses. And I'll see you later, all right? Bye for now. Hey, Alice. What are you doing? Do you mind giving us a hand with the housework, please? Can't you see? I'm cleaning the computer. <laughs> I see. I see. Why is the computer on? Uh, just a moment. I don't understand how to connect to the internet on this computer. Can you help me? Okay, but just for one moment. Thanks, Jack. Okay, click on that icon. What's an icon? <laughs> that symbol on the screen. 
What do you mean this picture of a telephone? Yes. Click on that. Right. Now what? Enter your username and password. Okay. And click on that button there. Click on the button. And now you're connecting to the internet. Hey, that's easy. <laughs> it's very easy, Alice. <laughs> you are hopeless with computers. And with housework, too. Come on, Alice. It's time to clean up this mess now. Hello again. Did you notice how Jack was giving Alice instructions to go on the internet? Well, I want to give you some instructions to do something at home. Now, in order to do that, you need one of these. What's this? Huh? A what? It's a napkin. A napkin. So, take a napkin, all right? Put it down. Open it up like this. Okay, so we have an open napkin. Anyway, now, take the bottom of the napkin and fold it over a little bit, like that, okay? Then, fold it again, like that. Then fold it again, and again, and again, until you reach halfway and press it down like that press it down all right now take the whole napkin lift it up and put it in this position you turn it over okay press that down now take the bottom of the napkin and fold it in half over like this again press it down well now Take this part of the napkin here on the right and fold it right down along the folds on the left. Press down. Then take all of it up like this and fold this bit over so you create a support like that. Then turn it around and bing! There you have something nice to decorate your table with. A romantic dinner, for example. All right? So, I gave you instructions in order to do that. And we're going to look at that on the screen. Because I used imperatives to give you the instructions, as I used for giving directions. All right? So, let's see. Let's use some other examples related to the computer and the internet. Plug in the computer. Now you notice we use plug, which is the infinitive form, and we use it for both you, singular, and you, plural. So, plug in the computer, ding, switch it on, connect it to the internet, and ding, click, on the internet icon, all right? So imperatives, they're all infinitive verbs. Now, the negative, if you want to use the negative of the imperative, we say do not, which is contracted as always in English, and we say don't click, click too many times, or don't press the exit button, or don't overload the desktop. Okay, so this is the negative imperative form. Very interesting, that. And don't forget to be here for your next lesson. All right, see you then. Bye. <laughs>
I'm sure I wasn't. Anyway, I was busy yesterday. Oh. Did you have a meeting with some clients? Uh, no, I didn't. So? What? Where were you? I was with Robert at the Red Lion Pub. That's impossible. Robert was at the party. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I always get them mixed up. I was with Charles. Charles was at the party too. Come on, Jack. Who were you with? <laughs> you are too curious, Alice. Okay, okay, I was with a girl. Uh-oh, and? And what? Well, what's her name? Do we know her? How old is she? Stop, Alice, stop. It's none of your business. Okay, okay, you don't want to tell us, hmm? That's okay, I like mystery. It makes life exciting. Well, let's change the subject. Peter, where were you yesterday evening? Why uh, weren't you at the party? I was at the theatre. We are preparing the performance. And you, Sharon? Where were you? Me? Where were you? Um, I was at home watching a film on TV. Which one? Um, the latest film starring Nicole Kidman. What's the name? Yes, Moulin Rouge. Really? That's strange. I remember. Here, look, it's on TV today. Really? Hmm. Oh, they always show the same stuff on TV. Oh, don't get up. I'll get the door. Hello again, everyone. Well done, Sharon. That was a bit embarrassing, wasn't it? Now, where were you last night? Well, I wasn't at a party. I wasn't in a pub like Jack. I wasn't at the theatre. I was at my first samba lesson. And it was great. Fantastic. You know, the music was really fantastic, really loud and exciting. And there were 30 people there. It was difficult to see the teachers. You can imagine, two teachers, 30 people. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Anyway, as usual, there were too many women and not enough men, and that's typical. But the teachers were fantastic. They were really, really professional. One was Brazilian and the other was from Argentina. Yeah, Argentina. Great, really, really good. And in the first lesson, it was, it was easy because we did some you know, basic steps. But it was really, really enjoyable. And I can't wait for the next lesson because that was so, so exciting. Can you, Samba? <laughs> I bet you can. Now, in most of those sentences, I was using the verb to be in the past. And that's what I want to look at with you now. Let's look at the screen. To be in the past. When we talk about something specific in the past, let's look at the form. I was... I was in New York last year. You were, see how it changes, you were at the party last night. He was at a meeting on Tuesday. I was, you were, he was, she was fine yesterday, for example. It was beautiful. We were at school on Monday, you were happy, and they were in London two weeks ago. So you see, I was, 
you were, he, she, it was, we were, you were, they were. Be careful about that. It's easy to make a mistake. Now, what about the negative form? Well, was becomes wasn't. Listen to the pronunciation. Wasn't. Wasn't. Okay? So, I wasn't on time this morning. You weren't here yesterday. He wasn't at the party last night. She wasn't very happy. And it wasn't difficult, okay? We weren't at work on Saturday. You weren't on time for work. And they weren't on holiday last month. So wasn't and weren't. Question form, listen to these. Where was I yesterday? Where were you last night? Where were you last night? Where was he, was he last week? Was she at work yesterday? Was it an easy test? When were we there? What time were you at school yesterday? And how often were they in class? So, the verb to be in the past tense, I was, you were, he, she, it was, we were, you were, they were. Very important. You can't live without that verb to be in the past. All right? Great. Well, we will continue with the past in the next lesson. So, See you then. Bye. There's a postcard for you, Alice. For me? Oh. It's from my father. He was in the Bahamas last week. Really? I was in the Bahamas last summer. Just you? Oops. Uh, sorry, Sharon. We were in the Bahamas last summer. It was sunny and hot. Perfect weather for swimming and relaxing. It was fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Oh, I prefer holidays in the winter. It's too hot in the summer. I like going to the mountains and skiing. My last holiday was two years ago. Two years ago? Yes, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I need another holiday, soon. Uh, anyway, was your father on holiday in the Bahamas, Alice? No, he wasn't. He's working on a new play there. Oh, how fascinating it must be being a director. Fame, money, and a lot of traveling around the world. And no time for family. Just a few calls, postcards, and a lot of misunderstandings. Why don't you call him now? I don't think that's a good idea. Why? When was your last call? Three weeks ago. That's a long time. Come on. Alice, call him. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear from you. Well, maybe you're right. Okay, I'll call him. Thanks, Jack. For your advice, I mean. Hello again for another important lesson. We're in the past tense. Now, I want to help you remember how to use the past tense. So I have another acronym. You know acronym? Look. Oil way. Oil way. Now, these letters represent the time words when you use the simple past tense. What do I mean by that? Well, this one, for example, let me give you an idea. This stands for yesterday. Okay, yesterday. Now, when you have yesterday in the sentence, you always use the simple past, okay? Now, do you know what the other words are? Let's have a look. 
An easy one could be this. Last. Last, do you know that? Last week, I was in Paris. Last week. Okay, now what about this one? Two days ago. Very good. So, two days ago, uh, we were at the sea, for example. So, this is ago. We have last, yesterday, ago. This one, mm, that's more difficult. Yeah, it is difficult. It's on in English. And we use it with days and dates. And in some languages, it doesn't exist. So we say on Monday, on the 7th of July, for example, on. This one here. In, okay, when do we use that? Yeah, months, for example, in January, in February, in March, and also for years, in 1961, in 1970, etc. This one, when. Okay, with when, we use the past tense. So, for example, when were you there? So, oil way on, in, last, when, ago, yesterday. It's like a rhyme. On, in, last, when, ago, yesterday. You need to memorize those. We'll look at them on the screen now. But it's important for you to memorize them, to remember that when you're speaking, on, in, last, when, ago, yesterday, help you to remember to use the simple past. So, to revise that. Our acronym OIL WAY. ON we use with days or specific dates. So, the party was on Friday or he was in London on the 2nd of March. Okay, the date. Then IN. IN with a specific year or with months. So, for example, she was born in June in 1976. Next, last. Last with, for example, the previous week, last week or month or year. So the examples are, they were in Vienna last month. When. Now, when with a past time clause, sometimes in the question, sometimes in the middle of the phrase. So, I was very happy when I was a teenager. Okay, that's when. Then ago, for example, two days ago, two months ago, three years ago. We were at the meeting three weeks ago, right? And then the last one, easy, yesterday with the previous day. So, I was at the cinema yesterday. All right, oil way, don't forget it, memorize it. On, in, last, when, ago, yesterday, always with the simple past. All right, that'll open up a world for you. Great. We will still do more about the simple past. It's an important tense. But the verb to be is often the one which people forget. So be very careful when you're speaking. All right? Great. Well, happy studying, and I'll see you again very soon. Bye. Good evening, and welcome to this week's edition of The Travel Programme, the programme about everything to do with travelling and holidays. Here in the studio with me, as always, is Christine Oteng, our travel expert. Hello, Lucy. Well, summer's approaching and, and the summer holidays are too, so have you got any suggestions for the holidays? Well, let's see. Are you bored with your usual holiday? Are you tired of beaches or trips to the mountains? Would you like to say no to museums, city tours and shopping? Well, why don't you try something new and exciting? What exactly do you have in mind? How about a holiday hunting for ghosts in a castle in Great Britain? 
Hunting for ghosts in a castle. That's certainly a change from lying on a beach. It sounds exciting. It is exciting. Something really different. Just right if you love adventure. Hmm. But what do you have to do? Do you spend all the time looking for ghosts? No, not all the time. In some ways, it's like a normal holiday. In the morning, you have a traditional English breakfast. Then you go for a walk or visit a local town. In other words, you do the things you always do when you visit a foreign country. But the fun starts in the evening. You have dinner and then the ghost hunting starts. With the help of one or two ghost experts, you search through the haunted castle until late at night. Oh, it sounds frightening. It is frightening. There are strange sounds. Doors and windows open and close by themselves. Yes, it's really frightening but exciting too. Tell me, Lucy, do you believe in ghosts? Yes, I do, but I'm not very brave. I don't think I'd like to visit places like that, especially not at night. Are there any haunted castles in Great Britain? Oh, yes, there are, especially in Scotland. Many of the castles in Scotland have got ghosts. There are some fascinating ghost stories. There are lots of books about haunted castles, why not read one before visiting Scotland? I see. A holiday spent looking for ghosts. A night in a haunted castle would certainly be a memorable experience. It certainly would. And if you want to see even more ghosts before you return home, try a ghost walk in London. Visit places in London famous for strange and unusual happenings. Christine, this is definitely an interesting idea for a holiday with a difference. Well, if you're curious about ghosts and you love adventure, this could be just the holiday for you. Thanks, Christine, for this unusual holiday idea. You're welcome. Goodbye. And goodbye to all travellers. See you again soon. Do you believe in ghosts? To believe in ghosts means you think that ghosts exist. If you do, then you say, I believe in ghosts. We say that a castle is haunted when it has a ghost or more than one. We say it's a haunted castle. Now, there are lots of different kinds of holidays and the holiday Christine just told us about is an adventure holiday. Looking for ghosts in a castle is an adventure. But personally, I prefer beach holidays. They are definitely more relaxing. Or perhaps you prefer city holidays. A city holiday is when you visit a city. So let's look at some of the things you can do when you have a beach holiday. You lie on the beach in the sun and relax. This is called sunbathing. You go for a walk on the beach or go for a swim in the sea. Notice the expression go for. You can visit a local town. Local means that it's near the place where you are. What about when you have a city holiday? You can go on a city tour. A bus takes you on a tour round the tourist sites of the city. A tourist site is something that tourists want to see. For example, the Colosseum in Rome or Buckingham Palace in London. You can go for a walk around the city and visit the tourist sites. We call this sightseeing and we say, go sightseeing. Just one last thing. Remember, there is a difference between travel and trip. To travel is a verb. When you go on holiday to a different city or country, you travel. A trip is a noun and it's like a short holiday. You say, go on a trip. This means to go somewhere for a short time. For example, go on a trip to Scotland. Goodbye for now and see you next time. Good evening, and welcome to this week's edition of Let's Talk, the Saturday debate with our commentators, Tom and Marie. Good evening, Eric. Good evening. Well, this evening, let's talk about the differences between the generations. What do you think about this issue, Tom? I think that over the last 50 years, lifestyles have changed a great deal. There's been a lot of progress. Uh, new technologies have helped here. Think about health care. It's very good today. Television and internet tell people about the world and what's happening. So, lots of progress. Do you think life is easy today? Yes, I think it is. 
There are lots of opportunities for everyone. Let's take travel as an example. In the past, it was impossible to travel a lot. Today, we can fly to lots of cities in Europe and it's very cheap. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you, Tom. I mean, it's true that lots of things are easy now, but there are also lots of things to worry about. And there's lots of stress. In the past, life was simple. It was all about the family and family values. Do you think that people today are confused about how to live life? That's exactly what I mean. Today, people marry when they're 30 or 35. When my grandmother was young, it was usual to marry young and start a family. Well, things are different today. I mean, women work now. 50 years ago, only a minority of women worked. I think this is very important for female emancipation. I agree with you, Eric. Today, women are fulfilled. They play an important role in society. Yes, but it's not easy for women. They have less time for the family, the children and the housekeeping. I'm not sure that my grandmother would agree. Life was hard for her. There weren't any washing machines or dishwashers or vacuum cleaners. She was the washing machine, the dishwasher and the vacuum cleaner. And after all that work, there was nothing to do. She stayed at home all the time. Today, people go out three or four times a week to the pub, to the cinema or to the disco. My grandparents were always at home. Well, life is definitely different now. According to Tom, life was hard in the past. Now everything is easy. Marie doesn't agree. She thinks that life today is difficult and that people have lots of cares, worries, and stress. And what do you think? Well, it's time to say goodbye to our commentators. Goodbye. Goodbye. And we'll see you again soon on the next edition of Let's Talk. Okay, first of all, let's have a look at the expressions we use to discuss our different ideas and opinions. What do you think about this idea? This is a good way to ask someone's opinion, or simply, what do you think? How about when you don't agree with someone's opinion? You can say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. This is a polite way to say, I don't agree. If you do agree with someone, then you say, I agree with you. When we give our opinions, we usually start with, I think, or I don't think. The use of that after think is optional. So we can say, I think it is important, or I think that it is important. Another useful expression is, I mean, and when we use it to explain our ideas better. Uh, let me give you an example. Things are different today. I mean, women work now. So I say things are different, and then with I mean, I explain how they are different. What about the vocabulary we use to talk about the things that have changed in the last 50 years? Let's take health care. It's the protection a country gives to its people like doctors, hospitals, and medicines. These are all parts of healthcare. Another important thing is female emancipation, the freedom of rights that women have. And some things that we have in our houses now which make our lives easier are the washing machine. This is the machine that washes our clothes. The dishwasher, the machine that cleans the dishes plates and glasses, and the vacuum cleaner, the machine that cleans the floor. Before I say goodbye, I just want to look at a little word that we use a lot. It's lot, and we use it to express quantity. We can say a lot or lots of, and it means a big amount. We use it with verbs, we say a lot, and it comes after the verb. For example, today people travel a lot. And when we use it with nouns, we usually say lots of. And it comes before the noun. For example, there's lots of stress today. Well, that's all for me. See you soon for another edition of Let's Talk.
Now let's watch the whole episode together. Look at the subtitles carefully and listen out for the language points we've studied, okay? Enjoy your listening. Now let's watch the whole episode together. Look at the subtitles carefully and listen out for the language points we've studied, okay? Enjoy your listening. Now let's watch the whole episode together. Look at the subtitles carefully and listen out for the language points we've studied, okay? Enjoy your listening. Now let's watch the whole episode together. Look at the subtitles carefully and listen out for the language points we've studied, okay? Enjoy your listening. Now let's watch the whole episode together. Look at the subtitles carefully and listen out for the language points we've studied, okay? Enjoy your listening. Hello again, and this is the first lesson of your elementary level. In this lesson, we're going to study the verb have. Now, in English, the verb have is really quite interesting because we can use it in two different ways. Let me give you an example. I can say, I have a brother, or I can say, I've got a brother. So there are two forms, I have and I've got. We're going to study those two forms in the next lessons. But first, let's return to our friends and their story. In this first part, Jack goes into the kitchen and he finds Alice asleep on the table. So he wakes her up. Let's go and listen together. Good morning, Alice. Wake up! Oh, good morning, Jack. Please give me a cup of coffee. Bring me back to life. I'm still asleep. Here you are. Mm. So, what are you doing today? Well, first I'm taking a shower. And after that, I have my daily appointment with Ask the Stars. Ask what? Don't you know it? Sorry, no. It's the horoscope I listen to every morning on the radio. It's fantastic. I can't start my day without it. <laughs> How can I go out in the morning without the advice of Ask the Stars? Please, Jack. This is not a joke. Our entire life is driven by planets. By the way, what are you doing today? Well, I'm going to work, just like every day, and Today is Tuesday, isn't it? Mm. I have to go to the karate gym. Wow. Are you doing anything this evening? No, I don't have anything planned. Well, Sharon, Anne and I are going to the cinema. Maybe Peter is coming too. Would you like to come? That sounds great. Which film? We're seeing Interview with a Vampire. Not that film, guys. I hate horror films. Why don't we go to see the latest Julia Roberts film? Mm. Oh, please. Um. We don't need more romance. We already have our love story in the apartment next to us. With Peter and Sharon, I mean. <laughs> OK, you are right. Let's go to see Interview with the Vampire then. Well, 
I think I prefer to stay at home. Now I've got to go to work. Uh, see you later. Is everything okay, Jack? Yes. Why? It's late, that's all. Bye. 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 Now, in that episode, Alice said, I have my daily appointment with Ask the Stars. She believes in the stars. Did you hear that? Well, in this lesson, I want to look more closely at the verb have. Now, it's very interesting because in English, there are two ways of expressing possession. We can say, I have my daily appointment or I've got my daily appointment. Let's study the first example, have, the simple verb have. Now, have seems an easy verb, but I often hear people making mistakes with it. I want to ask you a question. What is the question form of this phrase? I have a scooter. What's the question? Now, did you say, have I a scooter? Well, no, it isn't. In fact, the question form is, do I have a scooter? Yes. You often forget do, don't you? I know, I know it's a problem. Another example now, and be careful. He has a scooter. The question, what's the question? Does he have a scooter? Okay, now don't forget to use the auxiliary with the verb have. It's like any other verb. It's like go, like walk, like eat. It's not like the verb to be. Okay, so we need to use do and does. Let's look at all the forms of the verb have now. Listen to the examples. I have blue eyes. You have a new car. She has a cat. He has a dog. It has four doors. Remember, don't forget the S on the third person. We have a garden. You have a course. And they have three children. All right? Now, in the negative form, don't forget to use the auxiliary. The negative form is not I haven't, but I don't have. Listen to the examples. I don't have blue eyes. You don't have a new car. Now be careful with the third person. Don't forget the S. It becomes she doesn't have a cat. He doesn't have a dog. It doesn't have four doors. Look at that pronunciation, doesn't. We don't have a garden. You don't have a course. And they don't have three children. Okay, so remember the auxiliaries, does, doesn't, don't, and do. Now, in the question, it's the same. Don't forget the auxiliary. The questions are, do I have blue eyes? Do you have a new car? Does she have a cat? Does he have a dog? Does it have four doors? Do we have a garden? Do you have a course? And do they have three children? All right, so the auxiliaries, always auxiliaries with the verb have. Now, another interesting thing about have is that we use it with special expressions. In fact, we use it with special expressions where often other languages use the verb make. Let me give you an example. At eight o'clock in the morning, what do you do? You have breakfast, for example. So the verb to have breakfast is a special expression. At midday, we say to have lunch. In the evening, to have dinner. 
at half past ten or eleven o'clock, we say to have supper. So we use these expressions with the verb have, and when we ask a question, we use the auxiliaries. For example, do you have breakfast in the morning? And in the negative, I don't have breakfast. Okay. Now listen to the following typical expressions with the verb have, which we often use in English. To have breakfast, to have lunch, to have dinner, to have supper, to have a cigarette, to have a cup of coffee, to have a drink, to have a shower, to have a bath, to have a rest. To have a party, to have fun, to have a good time. Okay, so that's the verb, the simple verb, have. Now let's go back to our story where our friends will introduce have got. In this particular episode, Sharon is having problems with her laptop, and she asks Peter to help her, but. Peter never has time for her. Let's go and listen. Fly me to the moon. Let me. Have you got a moment, Peter? I've got a problem with my computer. Ah,、uh, I don't know very much about computers, and I'm going out. They're waiting for me at the theater. <laughs> Always busy, huh? Okay, okay, Sharon, take it easy. Shall we have a look? Thanks, Peter. You've got a big heart. Let's see if I can help you before you thank me. All right. I can't use this program. I use it every day, and today it is an opening. Hmm. Why don't you turn the computer off, and then turn it on again? Okay, Peter. That's really a great idea. You're a genius. How can I do without you? I know, my dear. What are you working on? I'm writing my curriculum because I would like to find a new job. Listen, Peter. I don't know how to write it. Can you help me, please? I'm sorry, Sharon. I'm in a hurry. I have no time. I'm late. They're waiting for me. Very kind, as usual. Listen, Peter. Anne, Alice, and I are going to the cinema this evening. Would you like to come? I'd like to, but I can't. I have to go to the theater. Yes, I know. You always have something else to do. No,、oh, come on, Sharon. What's the problem? Maybe you're jealous of my career. Oh, Peter. I'm just tired of always coming second. Now, in that episode, Sharon said, "Have you got a moment?" And she also said. I've got a problem with my laptop. She uses the form have got. In the last lesson, we looked at the form have, and now let's study have got. Let me give you an example of when we would naturally use have got. Now the situation is this: I have to move. I need to leave my flat and find another flat. And in the newspaper, I see an advertisement for a flat which sounds nice. Now I don't know the price, but I want to telephone the owner and find out more information about the flat. So let's look at some of the questions I could ask in order to have more information about that flat. I could ask, "How many rooms has it got? Has it got a garage?" Has it got a garden? And what about heating? Has it got gas central heating? 
Now it gets very hot in the summer. Has it got air conditioning? Has it got easy access to public transport? You know, to the tube, to the underground? Has it got big windows with a nice view? Now, this form has got was introduced into the English language to describe possession. But today, in fact, we use it in every situation where we need to express the verb have. In fact, have got is used more by the British, whereas the verb have alone is used more by the Americans. But it doesn't really matter what you use. Have or have got, the meaning is the same. It's just important to be careful about the different grammatical structures between the two. So now let's look at the form have got more closely. Listen to these examples. I've got some money. Remember, we always contract I have. It becomes I've. So I've got some money. You've got a scooter. She's got. Remember the third person she has becomes she's. She's got long hair. He's got a shop. It's got a balcony. We've got a house. You've got some CDs. And they've got some plants. Okay? Now let's look at the negative, which is basically the negative of have, which is haven't, plus got. So we have the auxiliary have plus got. I haven't got any money. You haven't got a scooter. She hasn't got long hair. He hasn't got a shop. It hasn't got a balcony. We haven't got a house. You haven't got any CDs. And they haven't got any plants. So remember, don't say you haven't any plants, but you haven't got any plants. All right? And then the question. The question is, have I got? Now here there is no contraction. Have I got any money? Have you got a scooter? Has she got long hair? Has he got a shop? Has it got a balcony? Have we got a house? Have you got some CDs? And have they got some plants? Okay? So that's the construction of the verb have got. The important thing is not to confuse it with have. So that's the end of this lesson. Have fun until we meet in the next lesson. Bye. Hello again, and here we are for some new language. Now, in this lesson, we're going to learn two new things. The first is giving directions. For example, I ask you, where's the station? You give me directions. Go straight ahead, turn right, and then turn left. That's giving directions. The second thing is giving instructions. For example, press that knob or switch that button, etc. All right, so giving directions and giving instructions. Now let's go back to our story. In this episode, Sharon asks Anne where a bookshop is. Anne gives her directions to go to the bookshop. Let's go and listen and see how much you understand. Okay? Houseworker. Yeah. At last. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Ooh, how are you and Peter? We're fine, thanks. Listen, I want to go to that bookshop. Do you remember? Oh, yes. The one with lots of photography books. Yeah. And thriller books. Yeah. 
And with the red coffee tables and flowers on the windows. Yeah. And where you can sit down and drink a delicious hot chocolate. Yes, Anne. That's the one. The London Reader. It's a great place. Yes. How do I get there? Um, is it far? You can walk from here. It's about ten minutes away. Great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Go out the front door and turn left. Easy enough. Go straight ahead, past the traffic lights. Right. Straight ahead, past the traffic lights. Turn right into June Lane. June Lane. And follow June Lane to the end of the street and turn right into May Avenue. Just a moment. Turn left on May Avenue. No, no, no. Turn right into May Avenue and the bookshop is Hi, the... Sharon. What are you girls talking about? I'm giving Sharon directions for the London Reader. So, uh, turn right into May Avenue and the bookshop is the second shop on the left, next to the butchers. <laughs> no, Anne. Sharon, the bookshop is on the right past the museum and between a chemist and a bank. No, <laughs> no, Jack, you are wrong. Yeah. The bookshop is... Okay, the... okay, guys, be quiet. Don't worry, I've got my map. Uh, Sharon, I can come with you, if you don't mind. Great, that's very kind of you, Jack. <coughs> Housework? Do you remember? So did you hear Anne giving directions to the bookshop? She said, Go out of the front door, turn left, turn left, go straight ahead, straight ahead, pass the traffic lights, you know traffic lights, green, orange, red, and then turn right into June Street and go to the end of the street. Then turn right again into May Avenue. Go straight along May Avenue and the bookshop is the second on the left. Now, when we give directions in English, we use the imperative form. So, what is the imperative form? Well, the imperative form is very easy because it's just the infinitive form of the verb. For example, stand up, sit down, turn right, turn left. It's very easy. So the most typical directions we use in English are turn right, turn left, go straight ahead or go straight on, which have the same meaning. So those are the ways we give directions using the imperative form. Now let's go back to our story and we will hear Jack giving Alice instructions about connecting to the internet. He says things like, press on this icon and enter your name and password. Let's go and join them and listen to that. Hey Alice, what are you doing? Do you mind giving us a hand with the housework, please? Can't you see? I'm cleaning the computer. <laughs> I see. I see. Why is the computer on? Just a moment. I don't understand how to connect to the internet on this computer. Can you help me? Okay, but just for one moment. Thanks, Jack.
Okay. Click on that icon. What's an icon? <laughs> that symbol on the screen. Oh, do you mean this picture of a telephone? Yes. Click on that. Right. Now what? Enter your username and password. Okay. And click on that button there. Click on the button. And now you're connecting to the internet. Hey, that's easy. <laughs> it's very easy, Alice. <laughs> you are hopeless with computers. And with housework, too. Come on, Alice. It's time to clean up this mess now. Now giving instructions. Jack gave Alice instructions about going on the internet. He said, plug in the computer, switch it on, connect to the internet, click on the internet icon, enter your name and password, write the address of the site you want to visit. So again, we use the base form or the infinitive form of the verb. The examples are plug in the computer, switch it on, connect it to internet, click on the icon, enter your name and password. So you see, they're all infinitives, okay? Now the negative form is do not, which is abbreviated as don't. So it becomes don't click too many times, don't press the exit button and don't overload the desktop. All right, so that's the negative of the imperative. Now, the imperative in English is considered to be very direct and quite impolite. So be careful to use it only when you're giving instructions or giving directions. Don't use it in situations of request. For example, give me some salt at dinner, for example. Give me some salt is too direct. The form you need is, can I have some salt? So only use the imperative form for instructions and for directions, okay? Great. That's the end of our lesson. Goodbye for now. Are you ready for your next lesson? Good, because this is a very important lesson. We're going to learn about the past tense, and this opens up a whole new world of language for you. We're going to start with the past tense of the verb to be. I was, you were. You'll hear many examples of this in the next episode. So let's return to our story. Alice, Anne and Jack are talking together. And Alice is asking Jack questions about last night. She wants to know why he wasn't at the party. Everybody was invited. Why wasn't he there? She asks, Where were you yesterday evening, Jack? Let's go and find out where he was. Jack, where were you yesterday evening? Why? There was a great party at Mary's. Really? I wasn't invited. I can't believe that. Everyone was invited. I'm sure I wasn't. Anyway, I was busy yesterday. Oh. Huh. Did you have a meeting with some clients? Uh, no, I didn't. So, what? Where were you? I was with Robert at the Red Lion Pub. That's impossible. Robert was at the party. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I always get them mixed up. I was with Charles. Charles was at the party too. Come on, Jack. Who were you with? You are too curious, Alice.
Okay. Okay. I was with a girl. Uh oh. And? And what? Well, what's her name? Do we know her? How old is she? Stop! Alice, stop. It's none of your business. Okay, okay, you don't want to tell us. Hmm? That's okay. I like mystery. It makes life exciting. Well, let's change the subject. Peter, where were you yesterday evening? Why uh, weren't you at the party? I was at the theatre. We are preparing the performance. And you, Sharon? Where were you? Me? Where were you? Um, I was at home watching a film on TV. Which one? Um, the latest film starring Nicole Kidman. What's the name? Yes, Moulin Rouge. Really? That's strange. I remember. Here, look, it's on TV today. Really? Hmm. Oh, they always show the same stuff on TV. Oh, don't get up. I'll get the door. Alice and Anne were at a party yesterday evening. Now, where were you yesterday evening? Well, let me tell you where I was. I was at my first samba lesson. Yeah, it was great. The music was fantastic. It was loud and exciting. And there were a lot of people there. 30 people. It was difficult to see the teachers, you can imagine. Anyway, the teachers were really good. One of them was Brazilian, and the other was from Argentina. That's right. The first lesson was quite easy. It was just the basic steps. But it was so enjoyable, I can't wait for the next lesson. Can you, Samba? Now, more or less everything I said there had the verb to be in it, in the past tense. I used was and were. So let's just check the structure in the positive form. We use was and were as you heard before. Listen to these examples. I was in New York last week. Notice the pronunciation. We say was. I was. It's written W-A-S but we say was. I was in New York last week. You were at a party yesterday. Were. You were. He was at a meeting on Tuesday. She was fine yesterday. It was beautiful. We were at school on Monday. You were happy. They were in London two weeks ago. OK, so we have was and were. Now, the negative form is I wasn't. Hear that pronunciation? I wasn't. And you weren't. You weren't. Listen to the examples. I wasn't on time this morning. You weren't here yesterday. He wasn't at the party last night. She wasn't very happy. It wasn't difficult. We weren't at work on Saturday. You weren't on time for work. And they weren't on holiday last month. OK, so that's the negative form. Wasn't and weren't. And now the question. The question form is easy because we put the verb to be in front of the subject form. For example, where was I yesterday? Where were you last night? Where was he last week? Was she at work yesterday? Was it an easy test? When were we there? What time were you at school yesterday? How often were they in class? Okay? 
So that's the verb to be in the past tense. Was, were, negative wasn't, weren't. So now let's go back to our story and learn some more things about the simple past. We're going to learn when we use it. And you'll hear our friends using time expressions like yesterday, two days ago, and last week. So after, we'll come back and study that together. Okay, let's go and listen to them now. There's a postcard for you, Alex. For me? Oh, it's from my father. He was in the Bahamas last week. Really? I was in the Bahamas last summer. Just you? Oops. Uh, sorry, Sharon. We were in the Bahamas last summer. It was sunny and hot. Perfect weather for swimming and relaxing. It was fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I prefer holidays in the winter. It's too hot in the summer. I like going to the mountains and skiing. My last holiday was two years ago. Two years ago? Yes, it was a long time ago. <laughs> I need another holiday soon. <laughs> anyway, was your father on holiday in the Bahamas, Alice? No, he wasn't. He's working on a new play there. Oh, how fascinating it must be being a director. Fame, money, and a lot of traveling around the world. And no time for family. Just a few calls, postcards, and a lot of misunderstandings. Why don't you call him now? I don't think that's a good idea. Why? When was your last call? Three weeks ago. That's a long time. Come on, Alice, call him. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear from you. Well, maybe you're right. Okay, I'll call him. Thanks, Jack. For your advice, I mean. Now let's see when we use the simple past. Well, we use the simple past with specific time references. And to remember those time references, I have an acronym for you. And I want you to write it down now. It's OIL WAY. OIL WAY. Written O I L W A Y. Okay, have you got that? Each letter represents a time word. Now, can you guess any of them in the past tense? Well, let's look at them one by one. O is for on. We use this with days and dates. For example, I was here on Monday, on Monday. Or, I was here on the 7th of January. The I is for in, okay? We use it for months, like in June, in August, in March. And also for years, like in 1976, in 2004. I was there in 2004. For example. What about L? Well, L is for last. Last week we were at the sea. Last year the exams were difficult. Next, W. Hmm, that's difficult, hey? Well, it's when, which we use in past questions. When were you there? Okay. Then A. A is for ago. We were here two weeks ago. My father was here five minutes ago. 
And the last one is why. This one's easy. Why is yesterday. Okay. I was at the cinema yesterday. They were at school yesterday. So with these words, you always use the simple past. On, in, last, when, ago, yesterday. It's like a rhyme. On, in, last, when, ago, yesterday. So try to memorize those before the next lesson. It will help you use the past tense correctly. Okay? Bye. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of The Travel Programme, the programme about everything to do with travelling and holidays. Here in the studio with me, as always, is Christine O'Tang, our travel expert. Hello, Lucy. Well, summer's approaching and, and the summer holidays are too, so have you got any suggestions for the holidays? Well, let's see. Are you bored with your usual holiday? Are you tired of beaches or trips to the mountains? Would you like to say no to museums, city tours and shopping? Well, why don't you try something new and exciting? What exactly do you have in mind? How about a holiday hunting for ghosts in a castle in Great Britain? Hunting for ghosts in a castle. That's certainly a change from lying on a beach. It sounds exciting. It is exciting. Something really different. Just right if you love adventure. Hmm. But what do you have to do? Do you spend all the time looking for ghosts? No, not all the time. In some ways, it's like a normal holiday. In the morning, you have a traditional English breakfast. Then you go for a walk or visit a local town. In other words, you do the things you always do when you visit a foreign country. But the fun starts in the evening. You have dinner and then the ghost hunting starts. With the help of one or two ghost experts, you search through the haunted castle until late at night. Oh, it sounds frightening. It is frightening. There are strange sounds, doors and windows open and close by themselves. Yes, it's really frightening, but exciting too. Tell me, Lucy, do you believe in ghosts? Yes, I do, but I'm not very brave. I don't think I'd like to visit places like that, especially not at night. Are there any haunted castles in Great Britain? Oh, yes, there are, especially in Scotland. Many of the castles in Scotland have got ghosts. There are some fascinating ghost stories. There are lots of books about haunted castles. Why not read one before visiting Scotland? I see. A holiday spent looking for ghosts. A night in a haunted castle would certainly be a memorable experience. It certainly would. And if you want to see even more ghosts before you return home, try a ghost walk in London. Visit places in London famous for strange and unusual happenings. Christine, this is definitely an interesting idea for a holiday with a difference. Well, if you're curious about ghosts and you love adventure, this could be just the holiday for you. Thanks, Christine, for this unusual holiday idea. You're welcome. Goodbye. And goodbye to all travellers. See you again soon. Do you believe in ghosts? To believe in ghosts means you think that ghosts exist. If you do, then you say, I believe in ghosts. We say that a castle is haunted when it has a ghost or more than one. We say it's a haunted castle. Now, there are lots of different kinds of holidays and the holiday Christine just told us about is an adventure holiday. Looking for ghosts in a castle is an adventure. But personally, I prefer beach holidays. They are definitely more relaxing. Or perhaps you prefer city holidays. A city holiday is when you visit a city. So let's look at some of the things you can do when you have a beach holiday. You lie on the beach in the sun and relax. This is called sunbathing. You go for a walk on the beach or go for a swim in the sea. Notice the expression go for. You can visit a local town. Local means that it's near the place where you are. 
What about when you have a city holiday? You can go on a city tour. A bus takes you on a tour round the tourist sites of the city. A tourist site is something that tourists want to see. For example, the Colosseum in Rome or Buckingham Palace in London. You can go for a walk around the city and visit the tourist sites. We call this sightseeing and we say, go sightseeing. Just one last thing. Remember, there is a difference between travel and trip. To travel is a verb. When you go on holiday to a different city or country, you travel. A trip is a noun and it's like a short holiday. You say, go on a trip. This means to go somewhere for a short time. For example, go on a trip to Scotland. Goodbye for now and see you next time. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Let's Talk, the Saturday debate with our commentators, Tom and Marie. Good evening, Garrick. Good evening. Well, this evening, let's talk about the differences between the generations. What do you think about this issue, Tom? I think that over the last 50 years, lifestyles have changed a great deal. There's been a lot of progress. Uh, new technologies have helped here. Think about health care. It's very good today. Television and internet tell people about the world and what's happening. So, lots of progress. Do you think life is easy today? Yes, I think it is. There are lots of opportunities for everyone. Let's take travel as an example. In the past, it was impossible to travel a lot. Today, we can fly to lots of cities in Europe and it's very cheap. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you, Tom. I mean, it's true that lots of things are easy now, but there are also lots of things to worry about and there's lots of stress. In the past, Life was simple. It was all about the family and family values. Do you think that people today are confused about how to live life? That's exactly what I mean. Mm. Today, people marry when they're 30 or 35. When my grandmother was young, it was usual to marry young and start a family. Well, things are different today. I mean, women work now. Fifty years ago, only a minority of women worked. I think this is very important for female emancipation. I agree with you, Eric. Today, women are fulfilled. They play an important role in society. Yes, but it's not easy for women. They have less time for the family, the children and the housekeeping. I'm not sure that my grandmother would agree. Life was hard for her. There weren't any washing machines, or dishwashers or vacuum cleaners. She was the washing machine, the dishwasher and the vacuum cleaner. And after all that work, there was nothing to do. She stayed at home all the time. Today, people go out three or four times a week to the pub, to the cinema or to the disco. My grandparents were always at home. Well, life is definitely different now. According to Tom, life was hard in the past. Now everything is easy. Marie doesn't agree. She thinks that life today is difficult and that people have lots of cares, worries and stress. And what do you think? Well, it's time to say goodbye to our commentators. Goodbye. Goodbye. And we'll see you again soon on the next edition of Let's Talk. Okay, first of all, Let's have a look at the expressions we use to discuss our different ideas and opinions. What do you think about this idea? This is a good way to ask someone's opinion, or simply, what do you think? How about when you don't agree with someone's opinion? You can say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. This is a polite way to say, I don't agree. If you do agree with someone, then you say, I agree with you. When we give our opinions, we usually start with I think or I don't think. The use of that after think is optional. So we can say I think it is important or I think that it is important. Another useful expression is I mean. And when we use it to explain our ideas better, 
Let me give you an example. Things are different today. I mean, women work now. So I say things are different, and then with I mean, I explain how they are different. What about the vocabulary we use to talk about the things that have changed in the last 50 years? Let's take health care. It's the protection a country gives to its people like doctors, hospitals, and medicines. These are all parts of health care. Another important thing is female emancipation, the freedom of rights that women have. And some things that we have in our houses now, which make our lives easier, are the washing machine. This is the machine that washes our clothes. The dishwasher, the machine that cleans the dishes, plates, and glasses. And the vacuum cleaner, the machine that cleans the floor. Before I say goodbye, I just want to look at a little word that we use a lot. It's lot. And we use it to express quantity. We can say a lot or lots of, and it means a big amount. We use it with verbs. We say a lot, and it comes after the verb. For example, today people travel a lot. And when we use it with nouns, we usually say lots of, and it comes before the noun. For example, there's lots of stress today. Well, that's all for me. See you soon for another edition of Let's Talk. Hello and welcome back to English Today. And this is DVD 5 and the first DVD of the elementary level. And in this DVD, you will see three more episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by our special TV programs. You'll see our travel expert in the discussion around the world, followed by a discussion about the differences between generations. Then, in the grammar section, we will study the verb have and have got, and also the past tense of the verb to be. We will also learn to give instructions and directions using the imperative. Okay, so enjoy your studying and have fun. Hello and welcome back to English Today. And this is DVD 5 and the first DVD of the elementary level. And in this DVD, you will see three more episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by our special TV programs. You'll see our travel expert in the discussion around the world, followed by a discussion about the differences between generations. Then, in the grammar section, we will study the verb have and have got, and also the past tense of the verb to be. We will also learn to give instructions and directions using the imperative. Okay, so enjoy your studying and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> 